the Ford Model A. One of the most easily obtainable, affordable, good looking, easy to restore, and fun to own classic or collector vehicles ever made. So what is it that makes this car so unique? First of all, over 5 million of these cars were made between the end of 1927 and beginning of 1932. And because of Ford's metallurgy and attention to details and fitment and just quality, there's still a lot of these cars around and they can be had for affordable prices. Today on this video, I'm going to show you what to look for and what to avoid if you're buying a Ford Model A. It would be impossible for me to cover every possible thing that you could look for or what could go wrong with a Model A, and every car is different. There's always going to be somebody who finds a showroom quality, perfect Model A and buys it for $5,000. That doesn't happen to everybody, and it doesn't happen every day. In fact, it almost never happens, and it certainly doesn't happen to me. So I'm going to talk about what you and I, the average person, is going to run into when looking for a Model A to buy and what to avoid. Keep in mind that the Ford Model A's are right around 100 years old now, so finding one that's exactly 100% factory correct is pretty few and far between. Most of us are going to be looking for a Model A that's been restored at least once or twice in its life, and the problem is sometimes restorations are done by people of mm, questionable standards, let's say. So we're going to be looking for a Model A that has been restored as an example in this video. Not necessarily a trailer full of parts or a car kit like some people end up buying. Nothing reduces testosterone more than bringing home a trailer full of parts and telling your wife you're going to make it into a car someday soon. So let's concentrate on a car that runs and maybe drives, or at least has potential to run and drive fairly easily, and maybe has at least one restoration under its belt. That's what we're going to be talking about. So once you've decided you want to buy a Ford Model A, the very first thing you're going to have to figure out, probably the most important, is which body style do you want? Now, this particular car is a two-door sedan. Out of all the Model A's that were made, nearly five million, pretty close to a third were two-door sedans. And then the two-thirds was all the other body styles. And you've got the four-door sedans, you've got pickups, you've got all the lines of coupes, uh, then you've got the wood body cars like the station wagons, uh, panel deliveries, things like that. There's so many different body styles to choose from. But we're not going to be talking about the real exotic ones here because those are kind of out of reach, like the town car deliveries and things. That's just crazy money. We're talking about Model A's that we could drive and not feel guilty about taking it to the ice cream parlor or taking it on long tours with the club or whatever. So let's kind of narrow it down a little bit. So we've got the sedans, you've got the coupes and the pickups. For the most part, that's the common Model A's. If it's just you, your wife and a couple small kids, the two-door sedan cannot be beat. First of all, there's no worries about the kids opening a back door and flying out. Once you put the kids in the back, they're locked in. They're not going anywhere. The other advantage is with the two-door sedan being one of the most plentiful body styles, prices being low, you can get a lot more car for the same amount of money getting into a two-door sedan. But if your kids are a little bit older, or at least smart enough to not try to jump out of a moving car while underway, then a four-door sedan's accessibility just simply cannot be beat. Okay, so let's say you've got the body style thing all figured out. You know which car is going to work best for you. You've looked through some want ads and then you decide, okay, I'm going to go look at these cars. So you go and you check out some of the Model A's in person. The first thing I like to do, if possible, if the owner and the person who's been caring for the car is there and available, I like to size that person up just a little bit. Is this the kind of person who has lovingly cared for this car, considers it a member of the family? Or is this one of those like TV show cable access douchebags that just wants to flip cars and make money and then brag on camera? about how he screwed everybody. So start with that. Assuming the owner is a person of upstanding values and you decide, yeah, I'd like to do business with this person. First thing I do, you can tell a lot about a car by looking at its fluids. So I'll pull the hood up. I'll look at the condition of the engine. Have they been keeping the motor as clean as the outside of the car? Or does the motor look like World War III? And then I just start to look at the conditions of things. I pull the dipstick kind of casually, look at the fluid, make sure that it's not dark, it's not burnt or anything like that. There's no little chunks sticking to the stick. Hopefully no water, no foam or anything like that. Just give the inside of the hood kind of a once over. Just casually walk around to the front and 
look at the coolant. Have they been using 50-50 antifreeze in it? Have they been using plain water? Does it look rusty? Are there any chunks in it? Are there chunks of grease floating in it? And yes, that does happen. And then just give the car a good walk around. How do the tires look? Are there cracks in the tires? I mean, how old are they? If you can see the date code on the tires. A car that's been toured and driven regularly probably has fairly new tires, at least within the last 10 years. A car that's been sitting and they just got it running so they can try and flip it, you might see 20, 30, 40 year old tires on there and that might not be the car for you. People who are selling Model A's occasionally use the term numbers matching. What that means is that the serial number that's stamped on the motor matches the serial number that's stamped on the frame of the Model A. Now, the only way you're really going to be able to verify that is to take the body off the Model A, take the splash apron off, and look at the numbers stamped on the frame. That is the only way to tell, the only place that serial number is stamped anywhere else on the car. People can restamp motors, so numbers matching doesn't always mean that it's worth a premium. You can't even verify that until you take the car apart. The other thing to look at while you're under the hood, though, is make sure that if it has an original two-bladed fan, you get rid of that because the original fans tend to come apart and fly through the hood or hurt people. The reproduction two blade fans like this car has out of a solid piece of aluminum, those hold together, those are fine. The four blade metal or the six blade plastic fans, those are excellent as well. So if you plan on driving the car quite a bit, you gotta make sure it doesn't have one of those stamped steel original fans. You know, I think in many ways, buying a modern used car is probably easier than buying a used Ford Model A. I mean, for example, in a modern car, you just turn the radio on, and if all the buttons are preset to the hard rock stations, then you know the transmission shot. But on a Ford Model A, you don't have that luxury. You're going to have to do a little bit more sleuth work. One of the things I like to do is to feel underneath the edge of the fenders, front and rear. Reason being, when the fenders were made new, there was a bead as the metal was rolled over, pressed in by a machine that left little ridges along the edge of the fender. I like to feel that. If it's been painted well, you probably still feel some of that left over. If there's been repairs done, you'll feel that too. Now, repairs that are done properly, not a reason to be alarmed. But if there's cracks that you feel under the fenders or you feel poorly done repairs, keep in mind, once a crack starts in a fender, it really takes off and it's pretty expensive to have it fixed properly. So that might be a negotiation point. You can tell almost everything you want to know about how a Model A has been maintained its whole life by going underneath it. I'm going to show you a few things that you can do easily while laying on a garage floor or on a sidewalk. You don't necessarily have to put the Model A on a lift, but I did it here just to make it easier to videotape this for you. First thing I look at is shackles. What kind of condition are the spring shackles in? Are they well lubricated? They got plenty of lube. They've been lubricated through their life. The way to tell that, are they centered within the end of the spring? Are they centered in the spring perch or are they off center? Off center could be worn bushings, could be worn shackles. Either way, it means they haven't been greased properly, at least at some point, and been driven pretty hard. The other thing is to see whether or not the spring is in good condition. And the way to tell that very easily, especially on the front, is can you fit your finger between the end of the spring and the top of the axle? If so, your springs are in pretty good shape. If they're just about touching the axle, or if you can't get a finger in there, then your springs are getting pretty weak. You're probably going to be looking at springs at some point. Moving further underneath the Model A, what I'm looking for now is drips. So all Model A's leak at least something that's pretty normal. Even this car that doesn't leave any spots on the garage floor shows some signs of moisture in all the usual spots, especially right here with this cutter pin that sticks out through the flywheel housing. This is almost always moist on a Model A. That's pretty normal. Don't worry about that. You'll even see a drip or two from the drain plug on the bottom of the oil pan. That's fine. What you're looking for is major oil coming from the front or out the rear main seals. Now, the Model A doesn't exactly have seals. There's the slinger here on the back. But if everything's working right, tolerances are right, if uh, it's a Babbitt motor and they've been checking the tolerances and take shim out as needed, this will be fairly dry for the most part. Move back a little further under the car and you'll see the clamshell here. This is where the U-joint is. You'll almost always see some moisture, especially on the back of this, and maybe a little bit here around the edges. That's fine. Look for any major hemorrhaging from the clamshell. You want to look for that. And uh, this car has a Mitchell overdrive in it, so the speedometer drive would normally be right in this area, and it isn't on this car because it's back here on the overdrive. So look for oil around the clamshell where the speedometer drive is, or in this case, 
on this Mitchell overdrive, the speedometer drive comes from back here off the back of the overdrive unit. This one's been installed really nicely. Of course, it did a real nice job. Uh, and by they, I mean me uh, putting this in and making it look like it's supposed to be in the car. Move back towards the rear axle. Is there any leakage coming from the banjo? Is there uh, any leakage here from the sides where the uh, gaskets are on the sides? Uh, it could just be that the bolts need to be tightened if there is, but it also could be that somebody went in and chased these special tapered 9 16 bolts with a regular thread uh, die uh, and just boogered up those threads. They'll never be right after that. You can put straight 9 16 bolts in. It still never seals right. Um, check the springs and the shackles. Can you get your finger in between the spring and the top of the axle? If yes, then your springs are probably in pretty good shape. Make sure that there's been some grease. You can tell, look at the grease fitting here on the bottom of the axle at the end of the axle housings. And if it looks like it's been used, like it's a little shiny maybe, or even it's got a little grease hanging from it, then somebody's been keeping up on the maintenance. That's a good sign. The next thing I look at is the battery. This one has an Optima six volt battery in it, which is physically a lot smaller than a regular six volt wet cell battery. But check the condition of the battery and check the age on it. You might have to look at the top of it to see a date code on it. Moving back, check the wiring, the condition of the wiring, and also what kind of wire. Is it that cotton covered wire that Model A's are supposed to have underneath? Are they using the Model A type butt connectors? Or is it the kind of wire that comes from the hardware store? They're using those cheap crimpo connectors. That's the kind of things you want to look at for wiring. Make sure there isn't any wiring of unusual colors or rubber covered wiring that might indicate some weird problem that's gone on or even worse, a modification. Looking underneath the car, also check all the metal, make sure that there's no rust anywhere, or if there is, it's only surface rust that you will remove immediately upon buying it. Make sure there's no rust through, and if there is, it's something you're ready to handle. Check the floorboards, make sure that the wood's in good shape, the finish is good, make sure it's not starting to rot. That also means check the body blocks, like you see right here. Make sure they're not rotted, make sure they're in good shape. You don't want to have to take the body off the car right away as soon as you buy it. You want to be able to drive it and enjoy it for a little bit. So let's assume for a second we're talking about a running, driving car. So, of course, you want to listen to the engine. So the question is, does it start easily, and how does it sound? Does it start right up? How smooth is it? Does it idle well? Does it lope, or is it smooth? Is it snappy to throttle response? How much does it vibrate? Some of these things can be answered in a test drive, but just sitting in the person's driveway that's trying to sell it, you can tell a lot about the condition of the engine of the car. All right, it's finally time to go for a ride in the Model A. So if possible, what I like to do is ask the current owner if they can drive the car, if they will drive and you ride in the passenger seat. You can tell a lot about how they've treated the car by how they drive it. If they look like they drive it like they're being chased by the mob, chances are it could have been driven pretty hard most of its life. But if they drive the car nice and responsible, chances are it's been pretty well cared for. Let's go. Assuming the Model A's had a chance to warm up a little bit, it should run and shift pretty smooth. Listen for weird noises, and by weird, you know what I'm talking about. Those weird grinding noises. Excessive vibration. Yeah, Model A's vibrate, they all do. Try it downshift, see how it downshifts? See if it slides into gear easy, or you have to kind of force it if it grinds. After about a minute or two of driving the Model A, if you don't have a smile on your face, that's not the car for you. While we're on the country roads before we get on the highway, now's a good time to make sure that the steering on the Model A is in pretty good shape. So you don't want the car to be wandering and hunting all over the road, little bumps, little dip differences on the road. You want the Model A to continue driving straight. You should be able to take your hands off the wheel. The car just keeps going straight, doesn't do anything weird. You don't want the steering to be real hard either. You want it to be fairly easy to turn. Now all Model A's have a little bit of play in the steering that's supposed to be there, but not a lot. Especially if it has a seven tooth steering box, it'll have a lot of play in it. There's almost no seven tooth steering boxes that work properly anymore. They all have to be rebuilt. And if the car has a seven tooth box in it, chances are you're gonna be rebuilding a steering box.
now that we're up to about 40 miles an hour, now's a good time to do a brake test. So make sure there's nobody behind you, pop it out of gear, and just slam on the brakes. And make sure that the car stops straight and that the engine doesn't stall and it keeps running. Not bad. Model A brakes work really well. Everybody who says, oh, mechanical brakes are terrible, they don't work good, all they're doing is saying, I don't know how to adjust mechanical brakes. That's what they're really saying. Mechanical brakes work good. Okay, here we are at the state highway. Since this Model A has an overdrive, we're gonna do what you should do with any Model A that has an overdrive, and test it at highway speed, see how it handles. As we accelerate here, we're gonna get up to 45 or so. Now I've got the spark advance pulled all the way down. We're gonna go ahead and shift into overdrive. Nice and smooth. All right, let's take this thing up to 55, see how she does. If the Model A has overdrive, it should be able to do 55 effortlessly. Going higher than 55, it should be able to do, you should have plenty of pedal left, but you really don't need to. If it cruises at 55 fairly smooth, that car's in good shape. You want to make a special sure if you got any wheel wobble at all, don't even try to go 55 in it. If you got wheel wobble, you probably got loose key pins or something in the front end wore out or worn steering box. That car is not safe at that speed, so don't do it. Take it back to the owner's place. Include that in your negotiation because you're going to have to be rebuilding a front end, changing key pins, steering box. Some kind of major is going to have to happen. There are a couple of things that I would consider deal breakers when looking for a Model A. Number one, bent chassis. If the chassis is bent, that car's never going to steer right. It's never going to ride properly. You can kind of tell if a car has a bent chassis by looking at the alignment of the doors to the body, how straight that is. Also looking at the back of the hood, this gap right here, if it's narrower at the top, wider at the bottom, although that can be an optical illusion with the hood not being closed all the way. That's a deal breaker for me. It is such a pain to straighten a chassis. It's totally not worth it. The other thing for me, if I'm looking at a four door, rotten wood. Now, from the beginning of Model A production in late 1927 all the way through about the middle of 1931, Ford Model A four doors, the bodies anyway, were made by Briggs and Murray, and they were wood frames with metal over the outside. Now, some of the 29s, like my 29, that wood is petrified. You can drill it and tap it. But a lot of the wood that was used for four-door bodies, not so good, and now it's getting a little long in the tooth or soft in the tooth. But uh, the mid to late 1931 slant window four doors, those are all metal. You don't have to worry about wood. The only wood in those cars is just used to hold the interior together. So that's no big deal. But I won't buy a four door if the wood's rotted. I've replaced wood in four doors. <sighs> that's not fun. <laughs> not fun. All right, so let's talk turkey. What should you pay for a Ford Model A? Well, a really good running and driving Model A, at least in my market, will run you about $20,000. That gets you in the ballpark. But that's plus or minus some different things. Like, for instance, an overdrive, is that worth a premium to you? Or maybe a motor that's been recently rebuilt, has some hopped up parts in it, that could add value too. So it's going to depend on the car and the buyer. Even some things can detract from the value, like Maybe some people don't like non-stock paint colors. I mean, this car is painted exactly the same colors it left the factory with Copra Drab over Chickle Drab and a Tacoma Cream Stripe and wheels. For me, that would increase the value of the car. But maybe you like all red cars, so you would prefer a Model A that's metallic red. Maybe that adds value to you. So it's going to change depending on the buyer, the car, and of course, rarity of the body styles, things like that. But at least that gives you a ballpark figure. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope it helped you out. Please click the subscribe button right down there and I'll catch you on the next video.